But yeah, next next week will be our last class, and then uh, we'll restart uh, not in the summer, but after the summer, because I I guess I get my sabbatical. I suppose to have my sabbatical. So we're still in Hebrews, and uh, you know. I'll say it again, if you didn't notice, this is probably the most complex book in the Bible and probably the worst translated. Um, yeah, some of the choices seem, or the words seem a little bit odd, right? And every time I go through it, I keep, I keep running into words that I'm like, wow, why would you choose those words? Why would you translate it that way? I don't think it really changes our, our our understanding very much, but you know, as you see, we dig into the history. I think Tammy said a few people told me that uh, they were they never thought, you know, of Melchizedek as being a Gentile and being a priest of the Gentiles, and how significant that is. And you know, we see the details. In fact, the details keep going on. And here's some details. I can't leave you out the details. I, um, this is one of my personal favorite words. Dorias, and you see Doron is the principle of the word Doria. Doria means it is translated a present or a gift. So, for example, in a, what was that, Galatians, where it says um, salvation is the free gift of God, right? The word gift is Doron, Doria, Doras. As I told you, I'm not teaching declinate, uh, declensions of how to how to figure out the words in Greek, but rather, if you find this, you will find this in your Greek and Hebrews. But the word, the free gift of God, is is this word, and it doesn't mean a gift. It means a sacrificial gift. In other words, okay, and I know I have to repeat this because this is really important. According to what we've learned, did anybody sacrifice anything in the Old Testament era? What did you do with the sacrifice? You ate it. it. Yeah, you ate it. Well, well, that well, we talked about. Remember, there's the five sacrifices, and the ascension sacrifice was was totally burned up. But that wasn't what you gave. That was what the temple gave for you. And then the sacrifices. Let's see. I hope this is bright enough. Two, three, four, five. The five sacrifices. This. This is the Hebrew sacrifices. So you have the ascension sacrifice, which was a Holocaust sacrifice, but you didn't give it. That was given by the temple according to Josephus. So the temple did that every day at the beginning of the day to prepare the temple. That's exactly what we do in worship because the first thing we do is we lift the verses, right? That's the ascension praise. The second one is that this is sacrifice for sin or guilt. There is no sacrifice for intentional sin. So if you did an unintentional sin, you brought a sin sacrifice. If you brought, if you weren't sure if you had done a sin, you brought a guilt sacrifice. These were not Holocaust sacrifices, but you did not necessarily partake in them. The hide went to the priest, and uh, there was something, that, some of the pieces parts went around. I can't remember, they destroyed some of the pieces parts. But in general, the sin and guilt sacrifice could be considered nearly a Holocaust sacrifice. But these were not the primary sacrifices. Although you had to have one to get into the temple door per se. The third one was the fourth one was the priest sacrifice, and this was this was um, it was meal with frankincense on top and oil. And you took off the oil and frankincense, and the meal went to the priest because otherwise the priest would only get me. So that was his sacrifice and also the equivalent in our, well, the equivalent of Sarah Gilt in our service is the confession. And this the equivalent to the priest sacrifice in our service is the homily and the offering. Then the last one was the Thanksgiving sacrifice. And the Thanksgiving sacrifice is what we call or we know is the tithe. Yes, ma'am. Is the purification sacrifice that Mary and Joseph brought to the temple after they had Jesus a different thing, or does it fall under one of those? That is a different sacrifice, and that's called a, that's one of the special sacrifices. 
during if you in I, I haven't taught the Torah class in like 10 years I don't think I probably should do that at some point but if when we did the Torah class we not only learned about these sacrifices this is the daily sacrifice this is what the normal everybody does but when you redeemed a child especially the firstborn you had a redemption sacrifice that was given and it's specified in you know the Torah when you had a sacrifice for um, the wave sacrifice, the, the wave sacrifice that was given, I think that was a couple of times a year, you had the scapegoat sacrifice, which is entirely incorrectly understood. The scapegoat sacrifice was not for sacrifices that were intentional. It was only for the unintentional sacrifices of the community that were not acknowledged, had not been acknowledged through the sinner guilt. Because if you look at the sin and guilt sacrifice, you had to be kind of wealthy to be able to do those, although you were allowed to use a pigeon if you were, you know, a poor person. So it could get kind of pricey. But remember, the big deal of a sacrifice, the most, well, what is the biggest deal to us in terms of sacrifice? Huh? Christ. No, the big deal to us, well, I'm talking about our church. Although you're right, I agree, the big deal should be Christ. What does the church always want? <laughs> the 10%, right? The tithe. Well, that 10%. Well, not exactly. Malachi, remember the Malachi class? What did Malachi tell them they were doing that was wrong? He said, don't store up your tithe. The tithe was supposed to be what? Used to provide for the priests and the Levites. No, no, the tithe, the tithe was the Thanksgiving sacrifice. You were supposed to eat it. Don't you remember in Solomon? Remember Solomon? Went, or uh, Not Solomon, um, Samuel. Samuel's mother went to the temple. Why was Samuel's mother at the temple? She wanted a baby. No, no, that's not why she was at the temple. <laughs> she, she prayed at the temple, but that's not why she was there. She was there because she was her, her husband was presenting... The tithe. Every year you present a tithe. What happened to the tithe? Maintenance of the temple. No. No way. The tithe had nothing to do with the maintenance of the temple. The, you ate it. The tithe, was, the tithe was brought to the temple. Man, go back and read your Torah. Get your Torah out. you gotta, you got to know this. Because if you don't know this, this is, this is 100% of the knowledge of the Old Testament right here. The tithe was for only one reason. You brought it to God, and you ate it with the deity. You ate it with God. You sat down with God and ate your tithe. The reason that, that Samuel's mother, Samuel's uh, mother, the father, her husband, brought the tithe, and you were allowed to take the tithe money, you were, you were allowed to sell the tithe, and turn it into money, although they had no money, it's proto money at the time, and then you could bring that money to the place of the temple and turn it into food or goods. And so the people were able to buy alcohol and liquor with it. And so one of the reasons that the priest thought that she was drunk was because in this Thanksgiving sacrifice, you brought liquor and, and drinks and beer and wine and other things. And the people had a party. It was a festival party with the deity, with God. The tithe did not go. Matter of fact, the money that went to the temple, how did the temple get the money they got? In these, this is a holocaust, so it's all gone. In this one, the priest got the skin. The hide. You get some hides, and what do you got? Big money, right? The priest here got meal, so he would get his carbohydrates. And then who shared in the Thanksgiving sacrifice? The priests and the people. Right? This is where the teruma, teruma came, comes from, teruma. The teruma, this is teruma. This is truma. This is a type of truma, but you don't partake in either. Okay, the main part of the sacrifice, this is the main part. This is tiny part. Okay, this is done once a day. This this only has to be done once a day, but, you know, just is rarely done. Yeah. 
So when they had this Thanksgiving sacrifice, if you had a, a lamb or whatever and brought that, or a bull, I mean, you'd have so much food remaining. Yeah. How, how'd that all kind of come into play? I mean, not everybody, I suppose, could do that. But so. Oh, everybody, that's what I, you, you same did. question. How can you consume 10% of your wealth in one day? Well, you Other know, than going did to it, a casino. Did it last more than a day? <laughs> <laughs> because, because it lasts, if you look at the tithe, we don't know, we don't have any idea how the tithing was strung out. But remember. So it was not a day. It, it was not, as far as you know, it was not a day. It was, okay, in... Depending on where you fell in the alphabet, <coughs> yours was a different day. <laughs> Remember, there are one, two, three, four, five, six major festivals. Three of them are pilgrim festivals that the men are required to go, not the women. The mitzvot, but the, many times the men brought the women. The reason the men brought the women, can you guess why? To cook, because what were they cooking? Ten percent. Okay, now there are these six major festivals. In one of the major festivals called the Passover, right? We are not sure, but I bet you ten bucks that the Passover was part of that ten percent that went into that festival. That was one of the pilgrim festivals, right? And you had to be there. Or it wasn't a pilgrim festival. It was a non pilgrim mm -hmm. festival. You were at your house, right? I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. can't remember. I have to look back at my notes. But anyway, you had a lamb, right? And you ate the lamb. And what happens? Could you have anything left over? No. So who, what would you do? Well, you had to share. If you remember in Centurion, what did they do? Oh, anybody read Centurion? In Centurion, <laughs> the Centurion's wife was Jewish, and he was half Jewish. And so they shared their sacrifice with their neighbors. Remember their neighbors, the guy that rented them the house? He was their neighbor. He ran that inn. And so he shared, they shared it with three families, with all their kids. And so they had a lamb that was shared between multiple families. You could do that. And so you would take your 10% and your 10, you know, Okay, then you say, what's 10%? Okay, 10% to a rich landowner that had a farm was huge. 10% to the average dude that was pulling up fish hardly was hardly anything. Yeah, and you were able to turn it into money. We know this for a fact. You were able to turn it into money, and you were able to buy things. And what kind of food would you buy for these festivals? Meat. And it's the only time you got meat. Right? Because it was so expensive. Because it was so expensive and also because of what you had to go through to get it. Right? You know, you had to buy it and only had to buy it. But remember, and this was the big deal with the priest. And who is, who is saying this? Oh, you know, it, it, it's, it is a big deal. But remember, I've told you before that the priests in that era, they ran, a ga they ran a gangland land kind of thing. You know, it's like, oh, no, sorry, that lamb won't do. It's got a blemish. But I've got one here. And then they take the lamb. They buy your lamb, right, for trade-in. It's a trade-in. And then, hey, Mark, you know, put a little white out. White out that blemish, right? Yeah. <laughs> chop shop for, for sheep, right? So, yeah. But you've you got to realize this is, a, this is a critical thing to understand. And remember, the difference between the, okay, the sacrifices I made in the, in the Greek temple, Okay, the Greek temple, all, now this is true of almost every other deific temple. The deific temples, when I brought the sacrifice, there were two things I brought. I would bring the um, the Thusa. Thusa is the sacrificial victim. And Doran is a sacrificial gift. And you say, what's the difference? A Thusa is what? An animal. An animal that you kill and eat. A Doran is just about anything. Yeah, just about anything of value. It's something of value, like money or um, you know jewelry, a beautiful item, weapons, you know, shields, something like that. So this this is huge. Not many people can bring Doria, right? But most well, not everybody can bring Thusa either. But still, 
But in the Greek temple, every day people would provide thusa. Why did they provide the thusa every day to the temple? To fill the marketplace. Ooh, <laughs> you got it, dude. Mainly, mainly when I brought the thusa. Okay, so I give thusa as a gift, and what am I expecting? Blessings, favor from the God. Yeah, blessings and favor. Blessings and favor. Blessings and favor from, from the gods. Okay? And, but when I bring that Thusa, there's an implied thing there, right? The implied thing is I bring the Thusa, and the priests take it. Now, I've gifted it to the gods. The priests take it into, and we're not, you know, like a lot of this was written, not written down. We only way we know this is we know this from some writing but from a lot of conjecture, but we know what they did with it. We know they brought it into the temple, and they left it there. And they usually brought two different meals. So the thusa was done two times. Remember, the altar's on the outside. So here's the temple. The temple is always like this. Here's the holy place, and here's the God. Okay, usually a statue of the God. So I, I cooked the food. It was usually roasted. Roasted food. The difference between the temple and the... Um, in the in the Greek in the um, the Hebrew temple, but I, I usually roasted it, okay, cooked the food, I brought it in, I placed it before the God. You wait a reasonable period. I, we don't know how long they waited. Maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour, you know, whatever, until the God was done. You open the doors and you say, well, guess you didn't eat well, well, that's not what they said. What, what do you think they said? He returns it to you as a blessing. Thank glory to God. Thank glory to God because God not only took what he wanted, whatever, you know, the thing that you were giving him, what were you giving to the gods? The aroma. Huh? The aroma. Ever. Yeah. The, okay, you, man, you guys are getting this. This is beautiful stuff. The epithumia. The epithumia. And remember, there's meta-epithumia. Epithumia, meta-epithumia means the infinite line of the sacrifice, the scent of the sacrifice from God, man to God. Epithumia is the scent of the sacrifice. So when you smell the cooking of the sacrifice, it wasn't the Holocaust where they burned it. Ugh, but when they cooked it, when they roasted it, oh, you smell that meat. Well, don't you do that? You go by the, whatever, the, the steak joint and you smell it. They've got the things yeah. blowing the steak smells outside, so you want to come in and eat it, right? That's epithumia. Meta-epithumia, used by Paul and translated as pleasant, ah, means the infinite line of the scent of the sacrifice from man to God. So, yes, the gods would smell the aroma of the... Remember, it's in the Old Testament, remember? In the Old Testament... God smelled the aroma of the sacrifice, and it was good, right? So, the metapathumi is the same word for the Greeks that the Hebrews had in general. And so, by sacrificing, you were providing the gods with this aroma, this the meat, the cooked food. And then you provided it to the gods, okay, you, you brought it, you pro, prospheros. You prosperos, you brought it to the gods, you presented it to the gods. Remember that word, prosperos. And then you pros, pros agirio. Pros agirio. You took the food that the gods had blessed and given back to you as a blessing, right? Now who gets it? The priests get a little bit, right? And the guy who brought it gets. We don't know what the ratio was. The ratio, who knows what the ratio is? We don't know. No one wrote it down. But there was a set ratio of what you would get back. And what did the priests do? They ate some of it, and they sold the rest. What did the guy do that had brought the sacrifice? He ate some of it. If he had more than enough, he would sell it. He would sell it in the marketplace. Now, I, I would bet that most of this had become a market venture, by the time of Christ, it was a huge market venture. This, could you kill animals without the sacrifice? No. No. 
You can't kill living animals with, with blood other than fish. Fish were not considered animals, still not today by the Catholic Church. Fish are not considered animals. You could not kill an animal without a sacrifice. And so therefore, you were controlled by the priests in this sacrificial process. The whole market, the market was controlled through the priests and through the temple. Now, you put your theological hat on and tip your finger in, or foot into the theological pool, and you can figure out why the God of Gods wanted this idea. What's a huge idea behind this? The spilling of blood. If the whole point, okay, and, and now I'm touching a theological idea here, but you can get this, right? God's concern wasn't the animals. God's concern was humans killing other humans, right? Can't throw a theological thing in here. Okay, I usually don't do this. So why do you think God would want to make it such a big deal about killing animals because he doesn't he wants you to get that it's sacred Kill, killing humans is beyond the pale of this idea of deity okay that's I'll just throw that out now in this process they gave this thusa with the expectations of blessings and they would get a blessing look at the difference in the judistic process in Judaism why do I do the ascension sacrifice? Is it for a blessing? I make the ascension sacrifice for the privilege of approaching God. This is kind of like in the, in the old days when you approached the king, what did you do? You brought him a gift. Yeah, you brought him a gift. Look, okay, I know we don't have many kings nowadays, but if you ever go visit a king, what you got to do is you got to bring a gift appropriate to his position. So governments, when they go visit monarchs and deities, my deities, monarchs, semi-deities, right? When you go visit the um, the Roman the Roman Empire, who thinks he's a deity, right? You bring him an equivalent gift. That's why, for example, if you're you know the president of the United States, you bring a gift to Queen Elizabeth. And likewise, they do the same. And they do the same. That's exactly right. Even today, we follow a certain kind of protocol. The ascension sacrifice is approaching the deity. Well, it even extends much lower than that. I mean, protocol, when you go to a party that a neighbor has, sure. it's you bring them a bottle of wine. Them a okay. bottle of wine yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, okay. If I mean, it, it's not just, it's, it, oh, never mind. Well, you, you're right on. But if you're missing the point from this class, what I would like you to note in this class is just what you just did. You know, I try to tell you, all these cultural things have antecedents. And we think we're in a cultural vacuum, right? <laughs> that our cultural vacuum is what we do. I mean, we just bring wine to people because we bring wine to people. But you made the connection that's exactly correct. These things are connected not because we just do it because it's nice to do. It's connected because it goes way back in time to the beginning of when we were existent as, a, as civilized, well, or uncivilized human beings, right? The point is this, though. Do I, I don't make an ascension sacrifice to the Greek gods. They're already there, and guess what I know they're not going to do? Well, they might. They might curse you, right? <laughs> but if you bring them a nice gift, they'll be happy. <laughs> a drawing, right? Yeah. Well, well, the priest will be anyway. But like I said, if, when I do the ascension sacrifice, am I, expect, am I doing that for a blessing? I'm doing it so that I can approach God and God will not kill me, right? Why do I bring the sin and guilt sacrifice? Cover the bases is probably right. Well, see, really, it, it's not, remember, it's not good for intentional sin. What you're hoping to do is, okay, if I want to come into the, if I want to come into the presence of the deity, what have I got to be? Clean. You got to be clean, not impure, right? So we, what we forget, you know, in the Torah class, I taught this, but what is outside the temple? When you go into the temple area, 
the first thing you see inside the temple area, you've got the altar over here, and what do you have over here? A bath, a bath called the sea. And what the people did is, well, originally, we believe, they bathed their whole bodies. Women were not allowed in the temple area back in the old, old, old days. We believe they bathed their whole bodies. We know by the time of Jesus, what were they doing? They were washing their hands and their feet. As a matter of fact, that comes through the scriptures, remember? Where Jesus washed the feet and probably the hands too. And Peter says, wash the rest of my body. You know, what Jesus was doing was a reflection of the temple. Really cool stuff. But remember what you had to do. What did you have to do even before you went to the temple to wash your hands and feet in the sea? You had to go er you have to be ritually clean. through the mitzvah. Remember the mitzvah? Everyone, males and females, had to go through the mitzvah purification to be able to eat terumah. To participate in the temple. Mikvah? Yeah, mikvah. The, uh, the, um, mikvah. Mi the bath. Yeah, mikvah. Mikvah. The bath. The, with the, you know the, the ritual bath? Yeah. Today, some Orthodox men do it, but all Orthodox women are supposed to do it after menstruation, after they finish the period. It's, it's a, it was required, and look in the Torah, it's required to be able to enter the temple and have terumah. You can't, get, you can't eat terumah unless you do that, right? Period. Dot. So, these are not for blessings. These are just to approach the deity. How about the priestly one? What, what is the purpose of the priestly sacrifice? Are you getting a blessing from it? To fund the church. It's, the church. it's to fund the, the priest, period. Now, the priest does get a little funding from the skins, but it's, this is for the priest. It's to feed the priest, period. Done. You no blessing in there. Why are you doing the Thanksgiving sacrifice? Is that for a blessing? It is a blessing yes. you receive one. It's a blessing you already received. Yeah. Get this? And you get to enjoy it now. And you get to enjoy it now. Yeah, this is completely opposite. Completely different than the Greek or other views of the sacrificial process. Although, in the Greek view of sacrificial process, you still participated in the blessing. Sacrifice is not really sacrifice at all. In the Jewish viewpoint, you're not giving to the deity expecting a blessing. You are participating in a blessing that has already been given to you. In the Greek worldview, you are bringing a blessing to the gods expecting more. You're bringing it expecting more. Completely different viewpoint. However, remember, okay, we have this word sacrifice, but in the ancient world, the word sacrifice does not mean sacrifice in the sense that we think of it. Because every time that you sacrifice, you did what? Received. You received gargantuan things because, number one, in, in the Greek worldview, you were, you were providing to the marketplace, and guess what? You made some buckolas there, dude. That's big buckolas. If you were in the Hebrew, you were at least participating in the overall process of the temple and God's blessing. And by the way, we do the same thing, right? The Eucharist. When you go to the Eucharist, are you sacrificing anything? You are, you are receiving the blessing of Christ that has already been given. That's the whole point of John Christophson's Mass. That's the whole point of the Eucharistic Mass. That's the whole point of Eucharist, of the, of the Lord's Supper. That's why I think Catholics miss the point, because they, they actually call it their sacrifice. In the Mass, the priest prays that may this sacrifice be you know, pleasing to you. The first time I heard that, I was like, what? <laughs> you know? And they believe that they're like... Re representing the sacrifice of Christ and that is actually in some limited way efficacious for something like getting you out of purgatory a little sooner or something. Well, but actually, the word it used... It seems to miss the point that this is a Thanksgiving sacrifice. Well, see, we used to say it. We don't say it except in our, in our songs. But everybody, the Orthodox, the Catholics, Anglicans, Lutherans now say it in song. We stopped saying it in voice. This is the... 
sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And the word the priest, if the priest said this is a sacrifice, he's wrong. The words are, this is a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. The sacrifice was already done. Now, the, where people get messed up is in John Christophsonum's, John Christophsonum's Mass. It is he, he developed his Mass, so it is a repetition of the events on the cross. So, for example, in a John Christophsonum Mass, the priest takes the wafer, and it's, a, it's a, a big wafer, a solid wafer. He takes a big wafer, and he breaks it. And then he takes a little silver um, thing that looks like a, a sword or a, a silver um, uh, a javelin, you know, a javelin, a spear. He takes a little silver piece, and he punctures it. Because he is repeating, and it's not, I, I know it looks like it's, a re-sacrifice of Christ, but it's not a re-sacrifice of Christ. But the Catholics do actually believe, like they offer a mass. I mean, they'll offer a mass on behalf of their dead relative or something to try to, like they're doing something to get him out of purgatory sooner. They're not supposed to. That's in, in Vatican II. Vatican II was supposed to clarify that. So um, we can't blow the Catholics too much, uh, you know, too much badness because they did correct it in Vatican II. They're not supposed to be doing that. But even the, well, that's what, pretty much what they all do, though. Well, a lot of it comes from their Vatican I and the belief structure said in Vatican I. It takes a long time to change hearts and minds, right? But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to smack them too much because I think that they're on the right track. But even we do, and I wish we hadn't taken it out of our prayer book, out of our hymnal. You know, the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We read, we sing it. But we stop saying it. Just like we stop saying, what do we stop saying? The most important words in Christianity. The Christian mysterion. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Everyone in Christendom says that except us. What happened to us? Are we weird or something? I don't know. I think, we've, I think we're losing our, our grounding in some of the faith stuff. Anyway, but, okay. So the sacrifice, the Doria is this sacrificial gift that is beyond the Thusa. But, you know, this, we'll probably, have to, we'll probably all forget it, we'll have to go back over it again, right? But the most important thing to note is this. There was no sacrifice as we think of sacrifice <coughs> in the old eras. It was different than we think. And so it's very important because all of Hebrews is about sacrifice. So if we miss that point, Right? And, and remember, what does it say? Melchizedek tithed, and I think we, we're not there yet, right? But we'll get there. Melchizedek tithed Abraham. So that's why this is so important. When you hear the word tithe, you shouldn't be thinking about funding the church. You should be thinking, you should be thinking, that is a sacrificial gift that is given to you from God. The tithe is not what you give to God. The tithe is what God gives to you. Very important concept in the ancient world. Okay, so the other word. P-H-O-T-I-S-T-H-E-N-T-A-S. Okay, Photisthenistus. What is the basis word? The basis of the word is uh, fotizo. Uh, it means to shed rays. And so, well, let's see. Let's see where that this fits in the shed rays part and all those other things. So let's look at um, verse 4. Now, remember, in chapter 6, he said, okay, I'm not going to talk about, I'm not going to go back to the beginning. I'm not feeding you milk. We're going to do rations, okay? So now we're getting the rations. And that's what he's getting given it. So I'm going to, let's see, did we, well, huh, let's do four. I don't know if we got it, had a chance to do four. It is impossible, literally aduntus, not capable. Uh, four is added, those is added, who have at is added. Um, hapex, one time, not all times, but hapex is the opposite. Um, hapex means just one time. Um, ben is added, enlightened is not enlightened. The word is Fotizeo. 
Otizo. Shed rays. All right. We put enlightened in there. What is enlightened? Enlightened is a euphemistic construction, right? Yeah. It's a completely euphemistic construction in English because if I'm enlightened, it doesn't mean, it doesn't literally mean that a light bulb appears above my head, right? It, in Greek, if I said enlightened, it means literally that a, a light bulb goes on above my head. The word is photizo, shed rays, who have tasted, literally it's genomai, tasted the uh, above the heavens doria, sacrificial gift, who uh, literally genomai, who become literally sharers in the Holy Spirit. This is a very, very important verse, and it's very confusing. Let me see if I can... I'm going to give you a translation. It's kind of a direct translation, so it may, we may have to dig this in a little bit. Not capable, one who one time shed rays, tasted the above, the heaven, heaven, heaven's sacrificial gift, who became shares of Hagios Penuma. Three things here. Three things. He's saying that those can understand, those are able to understand, basically, those are, they're, they're participants, they're the ones he's writing to, okay, remember, the writing to the Hebrews, those are the Jews, right, the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, and others, who else we got in here, right, he's writing to all these groups, and so, He's saying that all you have to be to, number one, be off the milk, be eating rations, and number two, be the ones I'm writing to, are these three things. Shed rays, tasted the heaven, heavenly sacrificial gift, and were shares in the Hagios Penuma. The one is easy. What's the heaven's sacrificial gift? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, but most specifically the Eucharist. Eucharist. The Eucharist. In other words, remember, I remember like was it two weeks ago I went through the Mysterion, right? These people, these people, all of these people are Mysterion afflicted. They're kind of like us. What are we? We are church afflicted. What do I mean by that? What do we meet on Sundays? In a church. You guys don't meet in your home, do you? I mean, have you ever met in a home church? Have you been in a home church? Have you been in a coffee house church? I've been in a home church. I've been to a coffee house church. Have you ever been to a church in catacombs? No, I haven't done that before. Okay. What is church? To us, church is a building that we have built for the specific purpose of worshiping God. We call it a church. The Orthodox call it an ecclesia. The Jewish people call it a synagogue. Hmm. And, and that was a change, because how many are gathered together for God to be there in Jewish culture? No, ten. You've got to have ten, ten men. Right? Ten men have got to be together to have, basically, a body, a quorum, a, a synagogue. That's a synagogue. I thought that was just to create a synagogue. It is supposedly to have synagogue worship, that if you're Orthodox, the rabbis count. Because you've got to have ten men who are members of the congregation to be able to approach God. Two full hands. you got to have them. Bingo. You notice how these numbers come out? Interesting. Jesus Christ said instead that all i got to have is two or three. And you know what? By saying two or three, he did two things. Well, he's playing a game. He's playing a beautiful game here. He's playing a Greek game with you. 
In other words, what does it mean if I say two or three? And he didn't say two or three men, did he? Two or three. I thought he just said two or more. No, he said two or three. He said two or three. In the old Jewish thing, it said you had to have how many witnesses? Two, two or three. It's actually in the Torah, it says two or three witnesses. Now, what's very interesting about that is that's a very euphemistic thing. What it means is all I got to have is two witnesses. Reliable. Right? Well, see, we would say reliable, but God would say, I don't care. Right? Jesus, by stating this, basically told, he didn't say, he didn't say two or three men. Right? He didn't say two or three of age. Right? He just he didn't say two or three reliable. Now the Torah goes on to talk about the reliability of the witness. See? In other words, in the Torah, the point is this. How many witnesses would you really like to have? The more the better. Yeah, three or more, right? But God is telling you in the Torah that two is sufficient. But if you have more, that's better. better. Exactly. The euphemism, you know, Hebrew is a euphemistic language, okay? The Greeks would never tell you this. What would the Greeks say? You gotta have two, right? Two, and if you have more, the better. That's what they would say. But in a euphemistic language, you gotta think euphemistically. And I'm not teaching Hebrew here, but I'm giving you some of this euphemistic throughout because it happens to be here. We got a little euphemism in here because the euphemism we got is number one, it says you got to participate in the heavenly sacrificial gift. Can you participate in the heavenly sacrificial gift really? <coughs> Can you really participate in it? Only Christ could. Well, the, the, the sacrificial gift was Christ. Mm -hmm. So how do I participate? You see, now we've built it, we've built through John Christophanum this Eucharistic idea. And we have our own theology and our own ideas, right? The Catholics have transubstantiation. We have true presence. The Anglicans basically have true presence, right? The Baptists say it's just in remembrance. You know, the Church of Christ say it's just in remembrance, right? Does it matter? Does it really matter? What matters is what? That you participated in the heavenly Doran. Can anyone really participate in the heavenly sacrificial gift? Let's say, you know, we've been through this. Okay, we've been through this before. I know we have because the first question they ask. First of all, was there a Eucharistic Mass before John Christophanum? Probably not. There was actually from the Didache. The Didache kind of gives you a given thing, and so if you just repeated Christ's words, you probably could participate, and they probably did. But remember, they were fighting. There was infighting going on, because some said, well, you got to have a whole Seder meal, so you did it once a year, right? Mm -hmm. Some said, well, it just has to be the bread and the wine, right? Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, the Apostolic Father said it just needs to be the bread and wine because you can't have sac meat sacrificed idols, but if you want to and you have it available, you can have a Seder, right? Paul said... Go for it, dudes. I love Paul. You know, he had problems, but I love Paul. Go for it, dudes. John Christophanum said, and the Apostolic Father said, Oh, oh, whoa, 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 baby. Before John Christophanum, you didn't have a true Eucharistic mess. After John Christophanum, you had it. Well, the first question that came up was, if you do it wrong, Is it still efficacious or real? or? Bingo. They had the same question about baptism. baptism. Remember I told you. That's how we got to sprinkling. Nobody would be sprinkling in the old days because baptism literally means to immerse. The only reason we got to sprinkling and to, uh, you know, to dipping was because the early question was, what if, a whole, what if the whole body isn't immersed? Did it work? The answer was, of course. And in places where they didn't have a lot of water, they said, well, what do we do? And the church said, well, it doesn't know the... Um, you got to have water, but the amount doesn't matter, right? And so therefore we get the questions. You, this was all worked out before the end of the first century, second century, I guarantee you. They figured this out. But 
The question was, is it efficacious? And so the question that I ask you is, let's say that a Catholic priest does it in the Catholic format, which is almost no difference from ours, because that's what, matter of fact, Martin Luther and everybody did, right? Does it work? Well, yeah, you got to say, yeah. Okay, does it work for the Anglicans? Yeah, does it work for the Baptists Nobody's and the Methodists? Back. Nobody's come back to say otherwise. <laughs> well, well, remember in Acts, Paul told us, and in Galatians, I believe, too, that you are to <coughs> accept the brother on his confession of faith. Right? On his confession of Jesus. So even if you have disputes you still accept him based on his confession of Christ. And Apollos was not exactly following the straight line, right? He got the baptism of John and was teaching the baptism of Christ, but he had no idea, right? Remember that? So it was still a fictitious, it still worked, but it wasn't Jesus' baptism. You know, when we, we went through Mark, remember Jesus was the same way. When the apostles said, well, they're not doing it right, and Jesus said, oh, shut up. Would you just shut up? Come on, guys. You know, look, if, if, we, if, if a single thought is going to get you into hell, then nobody's going to heaven, I guarantee you. If a single wrong word or wrong thing, right? And I'm not saying to be a libert libertine. I'm just saying that what we do is we do our best. And remember, the whole point of, like I said, the whole point of that Paul and Jesus make is it isn't what you have done done is what you are doing. It is what you are trying to achieve. You don't sin to achieve, but yet the sinning isn't what matters to God. It's the doing that you're doing and achieving, right? You can sit all day and worry about your sin. I think Martin Luther got into a couple of funks. But what mattered wasn't that he was contrite or sinful, but rather that he did things that God asked him to do, right? In spite of what he thought. Right? You can get a funk, but you go, well, I'm going to go do it anyway. Like, you know, what a regretsy guy where you say, well, I'm going to go out and play hockey. See? Even if you're beat up, like all the hockey players are anyway. You, can't, you don't have teeth to eat with. But in any case, the other thing is, okay, so we have, we have the sacrificial meal. We have the shed raise. What is the shed raise? What does that mean? In, a Mithrin, in the Mithrin or the Mysterion, what you did, a routine part of the myth of the mysterion was the lighting of the lamps what other parallel do we have for lighting of the lamps yeah but what in, how about in the jewish what what is the lighting of the lamps in jewish i wish we did this every day anybody remember um uh, uh Tevye, um the, uh, yeah, what's the name of it? Um, Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler on the Roof. Mary Fiddler on the Roof. On the tub, on the tub. And she was lighting the oh, Shabbat. Shabbat. Yes, the Shabbat lamps. Okay, so the lighting of the lamps. What is? What are they talking about? Why do you get together as a Jew and the Shabbat in the Jewish thing? You can look at this lighting of the lamps, the basically the, the shedding of rays. The shedding of rays is, okay, in the Shabbat, the Jews shed rays. In the Roman mysterion and Greek mysterion, they shed rays. In the Egyptians, I don't know what they did. We have no idea. In the others, they're probably mysterions. They're shedding rays. In other words, they did what? They worshipped. They worshipped together. Yeah. So they worshipped together. See, what this is saying, in the shedding of rays, what that, what that implies, and we're using some euphemistic terms here, is it implies getting together for worship. So in other words, for those who were, and you notice it goes first, so those when the shedding of the rays, those were gathering for worship, and then the second one, second one is that they were participants in the sacrificial gift. So in other words, they gathered for worship, the shedding of rays, the Jews did it in Shabbat, the Romans, Greeks, and others did it for the Mysterion, you got together, and the second thing you did was you celebrated the sacrificial gift with the deity, which was the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving sacrifice, right? And then the final one is you shared in the Holy Spirit. Why is that the third one? 
What's the big deal here? We just heard the scripture from John. When Jesus and the disciples were together, right? And now why were you together? You were eating a meal. You didn't get together just to have a business meeting, right? <laughs> Even today, when you get together, somebody says, you want a cup of coffee, right? When you get together in the ancient world, you're eating a meal. And you know, notice the shed raised. They're getting together. They're in a locked room, and Jesus appears. And what's the last thing Jesus does? He says, receive the Holy Spirit. Bingo. The belief, and I think we should have this same view too, although we don't, although we heard it today. The Holy Spirit's in my heart, right? So we prepare That's what we prayed to the kids' prayer, right? The thing is that through the shedding of rays, that is getting together and participating in the Eucharist, we, be we believe what? The Holy Spirit. And we're renewing it, right? We renew it through those things. Th these people do the same thing we did. Now, if we read this, uh, somebody read this. Anybody got it right there? Read it in the King James or NIV. I've got ESV, but... Go ahead and throw it out. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit. Wow. You know, it, it's a toss-away. It's just a toss-away verse if, if we don't get into the Greek and the meaning of it, right? But once we dig into this verse, we see this is a phenomenally important verse. What this is laying the foundation for is it's saying that because you have gathered in this, this sharing of rays, you know, you've gathered together, you have eaten the Eucharist, and therefore in our belief structure you've accepted the Holy Spirit, you, you've received the Holy Spirit, then therefore now you are ready. You are ready to get the meat, the rations, the, the telios, the te, or telonekis, whatever this thing is, the, the rations. In 5, it says, um, and who is added, have is added, uh, gunome, and tasted the kelos, the beautiful, the beautiful of is added, the is added, uh, rima, the utterances of theos, and the powers dunemis, the force of the coming age coming age, not coming purpose, the aeon, and tasted the beautiful story of God, the force of the age's purpose. In other words, the shedding of rays, the getting together, the eating of the Eucharist, and the Holy Spirit is tasting the beautiful story of God that is the force of this age's purpose, period, dot. Literally, in the utterances of God are the words, the logos of Jesus, the force of the purpose is we are in the age of salvation. So in other words, the Greek reader would tell you that what is the way of salvation? The shedding of rays, in other words, gathering together, the eating of the Eucharist, and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. And that's basically what we preach, right? And the reading of the word, it sounds like. Uh, well, not so much the reading of the word, but uh, but you're right on the right track. The gathering. The hearing yeah, of the the, the, hear, yeah, the, the hearing. hearing. So before they had it written down, right. you know. Or one person might have been able to read, or they had one copy of a letter or something. Well, see, this is before they even had the Gospels. Well, right. they, the disciples right. gathered it to the teacher to receive an education at gathering together. Well, they had. Um, well, the purpose. I, 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 we're going to see even more of this. We're going to see even more of this. We're, we're going to say there. Yeah, there. I'm just going to say that the word that time would have been what we call the Old Testament. Right, which was yeah, fulfilled yeah, the in Christ. Old Testament and okay, then which, once which, which they started writing letters, they had the letters. Right, right because remember, um, 52, 52 AD, 55 AD, Paul's death. Right. Now, Hebrews, what is Hebrews? We think Hebrews probably after 70 AD. So they might, yeah, they might have had a gospel. They might have had a gospel, or maybe two or three, could have. Um, <laughs> but most likely not in great circulation. But they at least had witnesses, right? And people. That was the whole point. Remember at the very beginning of Hebrews? Because he was saying, we have sent these, um, uh, they kept calling them angels, angels, represent, we've sent the, the representatives, right? And so their, their communication or togetherness, and you're right on, you're not wrong. The whole point of that, the utterances of God, the, the stories, notice the word, use the word rima. Rima. Uh, I think I just called it right or wrong. I don't know. Rima is is 
means utterances, but it means stories. Stories. So it doesn't mean, okay, the difference is logos, right? We have a logical argument, a logos logical argument. It doesn't mean they're not logical arguments, but the... Uh, the, the account. I mean, you, they're witnessing the accounts of what they saw and heard of right. what happened. Yeah, exactly. Because see, there's a difference, right? There's a difference between if I, if I tell you about Jesus, right? Jesus, about his death and birth and things like that and his resurrection. There's a difference between me doing that. That's a logos. Or that's a rima. A logos will be if I try to convince you about how important that is in the world, right? So the rima are the things that, like, for example, the Old Testament and the other messages we're getting and the, and the witnesses and other things, which is right on in this whole process, this whole, whole experiential process. I don't know if we have time. Uh, I'll throw in six. We may have to restart next week there. Um, if, if is added... They shall fall away, literally near fall, parapito, to renew them again, literally to make them fresh, anew unto repentance, literally the reversal of thoughts, seeing that they crucify, they impale upon a stake um, themselves, the God, Son of God, afresh, afresh is added, and put him to an open shame. <laughs> Think about this in the connection. So I've got those who have who shed rays, they've participated in the Eucharist, they have received the Holy Spirit, and Paul, or the writer, not Paul necessarily, but the writer is telling you what it means for those who don't, who fall away, who don't, who no longer follow in the gospel, which is probably an important thing to a lot of us, right? We'll talk about that next week. This stuff is really important stuff. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray, amen. It'll be interesting. Is this where some of the Protestants get once saved, always saved?